Hi, this is Sarit Switzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 645 for the 12th of Elul in a regular year. So those of you that know me a little bit beyond this podcast, most likely know that I have a fascination with personality type systems. Some are better than others, for sure. And the two that I tend to gravitate to the most and that I have found to be the most insightful for my own life is the system of the Enneagram and the Myers-Briggs personality type system, which is somewhat loosely based on Carl Jung's psychology. But now the thing is, what I find fascinating about these personality type systems, and I'm going to talk about those two in particular for right now, is actually beyond when you get beyond the superficial aspect of it. So it actually kind of irks me sometimes when people talk about either the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs system, and they when they present the personality types, they kind of present them in this caricaturized kind of way. That was actually what turned me off initially from the Enneagram, was uh, the first book that I ever was uh, was recommended to read about it did this very thing. It really took the types and it presented them in this very caricaturized kind of way to the point that I actually mistyped myself because the way they presented my, my real type was just so like extreme and just didn't really speak to me. Um, And for Myers-Briggs as well, it's like there's a way to to explain the types in this very superficial way, but then there's a deeper way to look at it. What what am I talking about in terms of the deeper way? Well, in the Enneagram, the way it works, those of you that aren't so familiar, is you have your core type. So I'm a core type three, for example, and I'm not going to get into the whole thing today because that would take too long. Maybe another episode I'll do that. But um, But my core type is three, which is motivated by success and image and all of that. But then in addition to being a core type three, I have a wing and the wing is a four wing. That is what is, what is the type four? The four is the spiritual person, the individualist, the creative, the sensitive person. So these two sides might sound like polar opposites. Like one person um, on the one hand being somebody who's very driven and very successful and very into their image. And on the other hand, they have this other side of them, this wing side of them that is a, that is actually, um, into being an individual, being real, being authentic, being spiritual, looking beyond the superficial, right? Then there's also the points of integration, the points of disintegration, and that also adds complexity to the individual. Uh, So I think that's really interesting. And I think that that actually is where the system can be really useful is when you look at a person, not just in terms of their core number, but you look at them in terms of what's going on behind the scenes. What else is there besides what you just see at first glance? Myers-Briggs is the same thing. So again, I'll use myself because it's the easiest example. So in the Myers-Briggs personality type system, I'm an INTJ, which those of you who are familiar with the system, the stereotype of the INTJ, the kind of like, again, caricature of the INTJ is this very robotic kind of like almost um, autistic (laughs) to the point kind of person. Uh, Like some famous INTJs are Mark Zuckerberg, Ayn Rand, Elon Musk actually is an INTJ. So it's like a very, you know, kind of um, engineer, computer-y kind of person who's very logical and that kind of thing. But now the thing is that gets interesting with Myers-Briggs as well is there's something called the functions. And the functions is, again, just like kind of like that wing or the points of integration and disintegration that you find in the Enneagram, the, the, the functions are what's going on behind the surface. There's sort of like the, the underlying like behind the scenes kind of thing. So for an INTJ, for example, their primary uh, function is introverted intuition, which is 
okay, maybe you can say that's still kind of could be somewhat rainy ish, but it's not so much. It's, it's a little bit more subtle. It's a little bit more spiritual kind of like intuition. Isn't something it's a little bit more abstract than that. The second function of the INTJ is the extroverted thinking part, which is all about teaching and everything, which kind of makes sense in terms of my podcast that we're very good at, at explaining ideas and that kind of thing. The third function and the fourth function is where it gets extra interesting is the third function for an INTJ is an introverted feeler. So actually unknown to many people, uh, INTJs actually, while they may appear very uh, logical on the surface and very brainy and almost stoic kind of like they're kind of um, famous for not showing too many expressions, not being overly effusive with their emotions and that kind of thing. They actually have very, very deep emotions. That's the introverted feeling part. And then the last function, which I also find really fascinating is extroverted sensing, which is all about just uh, being really indulgent in physical reality, being very physical, being very sensory and that kind of thing, which I think for me could be, could explain kind of my obsession with contortion and yoga and that kind of thing. And you'll often find this with many INTJs that they're very athletic or they're very into some kind of like physical discipline. So anyways, why am I going off on this whole tangent about Myers-Briggs and the Enneagram and all that? Aside from the fact that I just find it really interesting, and again, what I find interesting about it is getting beyond the superficial, but actually looking at what's happening underneath the surface is that this is actually going to parallel what we're going to learn about in Tanya today, because in Tanya too, it talks about different types of people. It's, it gets deeper than just simple personality types, because when it comes to personality types, we can talk about, okay, is it nature? Is it nurture? Is this how much of our personality type is, was shaped by our early childhood experiences? How much of it was shaped by um, our DNA, by our upbringing, different things that happened to us, you know, things like that. But in Tanya, we're actually going to talk about different types of people in terms of their soul root. And the altar Rebbe is going to explain to us that there are two main categories of people, uh, two main categories of Jews in terms of their soul root. What are these two categories? Category number one is a chassid kind of person, person who a person whose soul root is in chassid. And category two is a person whose soul root is in gvora. So what does this mean and how does it manifest? So somebody who is, so whose soul root is rooted in chesed. So if you've been following along the, pod, the podcast, you know by now that chesed is all about giving, kindness, it's overflowing, it's kind of uh, extroverted energy, it's it's uh, outpouring, it's, it's expansive is the best way that we can think about it. So this is the type of person who, in terms of their service of God, they're going to be very expansive in terms of it. They're not going to be so detail-oriented necessarily. They're not necessarily going to be the quietest person in the room. They're the type of person who's going to give a lot of tzaka. They're going to do everything with a bang. They might go over and above the letter of the law, like buy like tons of food for Shabbos, like way more, you know, get that extra, extra meat, you know, the best wine all that kind of stuff. Invite tons of guests, that kind of thing. Okay, so that sounds pretty good, right? So what about the Gvora person? What's the Gvora person, the, the source of the Gvora person? So we know that Gvora we spoke about is this whole idea of constriction, restriction, maybe judgy a little bit, like judgment oriented. Um, so, okay, that sounds pretty negative, right? But it's not really so negative because somebody who comes from Gvora, the great thing about them is they're going to be the type of person who is actually very meticulous and they're going to make sure to give exactly the right amounts. They're going to be very careful with their accounting, the exact amount to tzedaka. They're going to be very halachically oriented, very check the letter of the law. What time exactly do we go by Rabbeinu Tam? Do we go by this or, you know, whatever in terms of bringing in Shabbos, taking out Shabbos, kashrus, they're going to be so meticulous about it all. And they're actually also, in addition to this, they're actually going to be a very humble and sneeze kind of person, a modest person. So they'll also give tzedakah because according to the letter of the law, you actually have to give quite a good amount of tzedakah, but they're not going to do it with this big bang. They're not going to like make sure that their name is like on all these plaques and stuff like that. If they're just going to give, you know, they're going to give because you're supposed to give and they're going to be careful about making sure that they give a right amount. So that's going to be the subject of today's Tanya, really exploring and uh, and looking at these two different types of people, uh, depending on their soul root, those who come from Chesed and those who come from Gvura. We're going to be starting a new epistle today, Epistle 13, and we're going to be continuing this epistle um, tomorrow as well as the day after that, when we're actually going to get deeper into these 
quote unquote personality types or soul roots. And we'll see how not only is there a place for each one of them, but actually, just like La Havdiel, you know, when it comes to Myers Briggs or the Enneagram or any of these things, people are actually complex and they're not just one dimensional. Uh, even though somebody's soul root might come from a certain place, come from Chassad, for example, that doesn't mean that they should negate Gvora. In fact, as we'll see, this is what we're going to talk about more tomorrow. We really actually should incorporate both of these energies within ourselves. And we actually, everybody does have these two energies within themselves. It's just a question of which one is, is more dominant, is more, um, you know, takes the front stage. And uh, in the conclusion of the this epistle, which is going to come up, up in a couple of days from now, we're actually going to really... Uh, pay extra focus to the attribute of chassad and see how in a certain sense chassad is sort of like the all-encompassing um, trait and how this attribute of chassad is actually latent uh, or revealed or both within every single individual. So stay tuned for that. That's a little bit of a sneak preview of what's coming, but uh, for today we're really going to give a basic description of these two soul roots, these two different types of people, the chassad people and the gvara people. So the all trumpet begins, and he actually begins with a, a quote, which is from Tehillim chapter 31, verse 20, where it says, Marav tufra asher echa begomer, which means, how abundant is your goodness, which you have hidden away for those who fear you. Uh, and so, okay, so we're going to try to break down that pasuk, which if I'm going to say it again, and in the context of the introduction, maybe you can start to decipher it a little bit on your own. How abundant is your goodness, which you have hidden away for those who fear you. Okay, so let's get into the text and try to break it down. So the altar says that in general, when we talk about people who serve God, there are two aspects and two levels that are very, that are distinct, that are divided in terms of the, the root of a person's soul above in a way of right or left. Meaning to say that the aspect of the left is the aspect of symptom, the aspect of constriction and the concealment in the service of God. As it says, Hatsne lechet imashem So that uh, is that means walk modestly with God your God. That's from Micha chapter six verse eight. And also there's another verse. This one is from Yermiyahu chapter thirteen verse seventeen. Tivke That in secret places my soul weeps. So again, there's something about this like secret places, modest places, uh, being modest, all that stuff. And then now there's a, also the ultra but cites a teaching from the Gemara. This is from Moed Katan, page 16b, where it says, um, that anybody who, and I actually looked up the citation and the exact wording is actually, so um, and the, 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 the Gemara says anybody who's involved in Torah study on the inside, meaning in secret, that's the, what the altar is bringing out, then the Torah proclaims on his behalf from the outside. So it's kind of like the idea there's, again, praising this idea of there's something to be said about being modest in your Torah study uh, and being modest in general in your life and your service of God. And so this idea of modesty. So again, we think of contraction, we think of concealment, we think of that stuff as like kind of negative maybe. But in fact, this, there's something very positive about it. The idea of modesty is a very, very great trait and doing things without a huge like hurrah and like needing lots of praise and stuff like that. That is a very big trait. And that also comes from this, as this aspect of the symptom, this aspect of the limitation and the constriction in serving God, which is from this place of Gvura. Like for example, when giving staka, a person really thinks about what they're able to, what, uh, you know, what their means will allow them to give. And the, there's that teaching that we learned about previously that comes from the Gemara in Ketuvos, page 50a, where it says, that a person who um, gives charity shouldn't give more than, fifth, than a, a fifth of their income, 20% of their income. So again, it's somebody who's very exacting in terms of what they give, in terms of their staka and things like that. So we see also with like Torah study and other mitzvahs that it's enough for this type of person that they're, they 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 do what they need to do. They're, they're uh, yotze with what they do as according to the letter of the law. They set aside special times for Torah study. So this is a very firm person. This is somebody who's very religious and they set aside these very religious parameters for serving God. 
And from this, this is where we also, we see reflected in the teachings of our sages. And this is a citation from the Rambam and in his Hilchos Talmud Torah, chapter four, halacha five, where it says, cast awe upon your students. So it's like to really educate students to have fear of God. That's the same idea also. So having a fear of God is also something very important. Um, so this is all in praise of the left side, the side of Gvora. Okay, but now what about the right side? The right side is the aspect of chesed and the aspect of expansiveness in terms of serving God with great expansion without any constrictions and without any uh, concealments at all. As, it's, as is, it is written, and this is from Tehillim chapter 119, verse 45, and I will walk about expansively. So there's this other contrasting attribute of walking about expansively without any kind of constriction, any kind of limitation at all. And there is no limitation to the spirit of their giving, whether we're talking about staka, whether we're talking about learning Torah and doing other mitzvahs. So this person isn't like sitting there calculating how much did I give to staka and whatever, how much do I have my set time for learning? They're just like into learning as much as they can. And it's not enough for them to just be yose, to, to do what they need to do according to the letter of the law, but they want to do it without end, ad bli die in Hebrew. So just like continue to, to the point of never saying it's enough. So that's the end of the section for today. And we'll continue along these lines tomorrow when we get into the next paragraph of this epistle. And as mentioned, we'll be discussing how, while we do have these two different levels the two depending on a person's soul root really it's important to uh integrate both of these traits uh within ourselves so stay tuned for that and i will speak to you then thanks for listening to the it is top podcast hosted by sarit switzer this podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather abraham yitzhak ben benyamin cohen of blessed memory music by shoshana if you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show Please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Taught project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.